looking into the world of private money and how can I get loans and stuff like that to do the things that I want to do. I, I was I was unwilling to wait to make the money to be able to make the moves. Hey, investors, Bradley here from Watson Estates, and you're listening to the largest, fastest growing podcast for Toronto real estate on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. You know, if you watch our show, I'm an investor and a broker, and I love to keep up to date with what's going on in our local market. But I also love to chat with people who are successful in real estate. And today we're going to dive into wholesaling. I'm going to be speaking with Waylon McGill. If you haven't heard of him, that's okay. You sure will. And you're going to love what he has to say today as it relates to the wholesaling community. He's only been doing real estate, check this, for two years with over 20 units. He has put together with a partner, Austin Ye, who we've also had on our show, a company called Fast Ontario Home Buyer. I've got multiple employees and they're buying many, many properties with hopes of buying in 2022, 100 units. These guys are off to a great start. I know we had a fantastic chat getting to know why consider wholesaling, how lucrative is that business, how to do it successfully, and just teach us kind of the ins and outs from what is one of the largest and fastest growing wholesalers in the Ontario area. I know you guys are going to love it. If you do, or if you have comments, please leave those down below, hit the like button, support the channel. Share it on Instagram. You can tag us at Watson Estates. Enjoy the show. Waylon, thank you for joining us on the show. How's it going? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. Uh, obviously, you've got a really big podcast. Been listening to some episodes and a lot of great content. Yes, I. it's nice. I was just teasing you, but it's nice to have a wholesale titan on our show. And you're absolutely that. You're crushing it. And in some ways, you guys are new to the wholesaling world, but you've mastered the system in such a creative way. So I'm excited to talk with you a little bit about that today, but maybe you can kind of get us started on how you got into real estate, some of the things you've done and maybe where you find yourself today. And then we'll get into some of the nitty gritties on how other people can maybe replicate it. Okay, for sure. Uh, so yeah, I haven't even been in real estate for two years. So I started thinking about real estate around two years ago. I, you know, I was talking to someone at a, at a friend's place and they had acquired a couple properties and I knew this person like, you know, they were successful, but they weren't, you know, in my mind, you know, someone's got to be making two, three, four hundred thousand dollars to be buying properties, right? Down payments, even in places like Brantford at the time, it's still a hundred thousand uh, dollars. And so um, once I saw that someone was doing it who wasn't necessarily much further along than I was professionally, I thought, okay, I'm going to look into this. Uh, so the first thing that we did was uh, I was, I was engaged at the time. Uh, I talked my fiance into buying a triplex uh, using her first time home buyer credit before we got married. Um, and then from there we did, uh, I did a duplex conversion. So basically a week after we closed on that, uh, we got married a couple days after we closed on that triplex. And then uh, at that point I asked if I could buy a duplex with my friend and my wife said, yes. <laughs> so I basically, I did a duplex conversion in Brantford. Uh, and we, we did a fantastic job. We were able to refinance out almost all of the money. Uh, it wasn't without his headaches and, and fears and anxieties at the time. You know, we found out it was all knob and tube. The original quote was like $30,000 to remediate, which is insanely high and not accurate to what it needed to be. Um, so a good lesson there, make sure you get three quotes. So, you know, we did get it done for about 11,000, uh, refied that and basically rolled that money into a cottage. Uh, which was right, right towards the beginning of COVID. Like we closed in June of 2020. Uh, and I was, I, ha I had tremendous urgency on it because I just saw what was going to happen. Good timing. Very I, good timing. Just, like we need to get in and we need something that is basically turnkey. So furnished and everything so that we can, you know, close on it June 14th or whatever it was and be renting it out by july like the first weekend of july are you long-term renting that right now or have you kind of jumped over to the airbnb show yeah we're we airbnb it primarily yeah. um the revenue is just so much higher it is uh and when you think about just like doing stuff like i just bought a hot tub uh for for winter rentals and you know like a high-end hot tubs like fifteen thousand dollars like tax all in but you just when you start thinking about it in, in business terms you're just like okay what do I think we could charge per week in the winter? Probably $2,500. You know, we're close to Arrowhead Provincial Park where you've got, you know, the outdoor skating trails. There's, you know, snowmobile trails go right beside our cottage. So there's lots of local stuff to do. You know, you throw a hot tub on top of that, which I think only 5% of the Airbnbs in Muskoka have. Uh, and so 2,500 a week, how many weeks do you have to rent that 
out before you're getting a positive ROI, right? So the nice thing, it's also allows you to improve your space, uh, the cottage that you go to, uh, and it really makes a lot of sense financially. It's uh, for anyone who hasn't looked up Airbnb, it's, it's stupid money right now in cottage country, just absolutely stupid <laughs> and good luck getting one, even if you're willing to pay the stupid prices, <laughs> but it, it, I love that. And we've had Airbnb folks on the show too. I love your philosophy of get it winter ready. I mean, the guys who do this, they say it's not the summer you got to worry about. It's getting through all 12 months. And I mean, you clearly you're doing that and uh, that's a sign of, of success right there. Um, so, so how many units today do you sit on? I know you got more than that. Yeah. Yeah. We're around 23. Yeah. And that's in the last two years, friends. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I mean, it's, it sounds kind of weird to say, I don't keep track very diligently. Um, I know it's growing. Um, I partner on a lot of those deals. So since then, right. Like basically at that point I was capped out. I was like, okay, this is all the money I have. And even that, like I did that original duplex conversion burr, I did that a hundred percent with lines of credit. Like I didn't have, like, I just got married, you know, I brought bought my primary residence like a year before that. Like I had no money, but I have a good job. And so I had access to a lot of line of credit and I just basically, you know, my down payment came from that down payment for the cottage was bird money. So, you know, you couldn't use your line of credit anymore, but I was able to use the Burr refinance money for a down payment, which technically had come from a line of credit previously. Right. So, um, but after you the were cottage, maxed out, you maxed it. Yeah. Out. It Which is common early on when you get going. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you haven't had time to like accumulate appreciation. Right. So, um, basically at that point I was like, I, I want to keep buying aggressively. Um, but I, I don't have, you know, and you can only save so much money, even at a high tax bracket, you're paying 54% tax. Uh, how much more money can you make? How, like, it's still going to take you a long time to save a hundred thousand dollar down payment. So at that point I was like, I need to get into an active income strategy. Uh, and that's how I started wholesaling. Um, so I was like, I need to have active income, but also I need to start looking into the world of private money and how can I get loans and stuff like that to do the things that I want to do. I, I was, I was unwilling to wait to make the money, to be able to make the moves. So from the triplex to duplex and the cottage from there, was the jump and in order to get to those over 20 number though i know you're not keeping units but it just gives some context in the last two years um that was done through wholesaling so and all the while also working full time where are you where, where are you where are you living right now where are you working so i live in downtown toronto condo with my wife like too bad too bad condo around king and spadina uh, i work for indeed.com i'm a senior director of sales there um, which kind of part of why I got into wholesaling is once I started learning about it, I was like, oh, this has relevance to my skill set, right? Like I didn't know anything about houses. I didn't know what a soft fit or aphasia was when I was buying, when I started buying. Um, I didn't know anything about renovations when I found out a house had an oven too, but that was not like a meaningful thing for me to hear. I was like, I don't know what that means. Uh, so I didn't know anything about houses. I didn't know anything about the real estate markets, not a realtor. Um, but selling and how to negotiate with people and how to uh, ultimately figure out what people need, like what, what do people value and how to get it to them is I think, you know, the core sort of what you're doing in sales. I was good at that. And so I thought, oh, okay, here's an area of real estate where I can actually leverage something I'm already good at. Yeah. And it's, so we're, we're mentioning real estate too. And it's funny because a typical real estate channel, like if we were real estate, which we, we do focus more on the real estate market, there's a lot of differences in the wholesale community than there is in the real estate community. A lot of realtors don't know how to do wholesaling and majority of wholesalers are not real estate agents for the main reason that the requirements put the burdens put on the shoulders of realtors are so heavy. Um, so I like to look at wholesaling as a bit of a cowboy type of environment, but um, with the higher risks and kind of, you know, in some ways I, I, you might hate me for saying this, but it's a little bit of ambulance chasing. It really is. And we'll talk a little bit about why, what would be a good customer or a good candidate for wholesale, because I do think that there's a place for it, but it's absolutely different than someone who's invested in real estate. So even if you've done this, the two, three, and you're familiar with the real estate game to go into wholesaling, that's, and all of this within two years, that's a big transition. It really is. And, uh, and all the while working full time. So 
let's maybe get into some of the details on wholesaling. You know, how did you, how does, first of all, let's start off with how does that work? What is that interaction? And then we'll talk a little bit about the ins and outs. Cause I know a lot of people who follow our show, especially earlier on in their career that don't have access to those, that capital or, or partners wholesaling pops up as a common conversation. So maybe we can talk about how that works and then some of the details. Yeah. So I would caution, like, there's a big difference between wholesaling right now in August of, of 2021 than there was in January or even more so than August of last year. Right. So, um, as a easy strategy to like make active real estate income that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, you can still find deals for free, but like the, the number of hours you're going to put in is crazy. Uh, but basically what you're doing is you're trying to find people who value something other than just price at the end of the day. Right. And, um, it's, it could be that they don't want people coming through their house. They're just dead set against it. They're, they could be a hoarder and they're just like, they don't want anybody to know how they live. They they're trying to turn a corner. Uh, the house is a mess. Uh, you can't even tell what all the issues are because there's, you know, there's just stuff everywhere obstructing it. Um, so it's kind of risky on both sides. Like you're going to buy deals where you're like, uh Oh, there's like some stuff that I didn't realize, but I bought this property as is. So then you're dealing with those issues, but basically people are trading convenience or speed or something like that for equity. And I think it, in some ways it's not that different than a typical real estate transaction. Like when you get multiple offers and you're comparing offers, like you're not always taking, like, I'm sure you've worked with people who are like, I'll take 30 grand less on this deal because this one has no conditions. And it means that I'm done. You know, I've already got this other property I want to buy and I'm done and I'm willing, like, I'm happy with this offer. It might be 30 grand less, but that other offer, I don't, I don't trust it. I don't know if it's going to come through and I just want it done. Yep. Um, so it's not unlike that necessarily, but typically there's some sort of distress going on, either the property, you know, most, most commonly it's the property. A lot of people start a renovation or something and they can't finish it. And then they're living in that for a while. They're just like, I want to sell this and it's, it's not going to show well. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of, and the other one is like seller distress, which is you try not to take advantage, but it's just like, if someone needs you to close on their house in two weeks, like let's not go to the bank and get a 3% mortgage. Let's go to the private lender, pay four points right off the top. You know, so on your $300,000 purchase price, you're like, okay, I'm going to pay $12,000 in lender fees. And then I'm going to pay 10% per month to, uh, to renovate and sell this place. And the costs, like for anybody who flips, you realize like the cost of flipping add up quickly. Like, I don't understand how someone could go buy something off the MLS, flip it and not lose a ton. Yeah. And, and that's the key. That's the key difference for wholesaling. A lot of people think, oh, the wholesaler is just grabbing it and getting rid of them. I mean, you guys, I, you've, we're going to talk about some of the deals you've done, but sometimes the numbers are so good, not where they stand today, but the upside potential is so good that you don't want to let it go as a wholesale. Wholesaling kind of becomes secondary in those environments. But um, yeah, that, that transition from like anytime we're buying. So for me as a realtor, if I were to find a wholesale opportunity, when I'm budgeting it in, I need to see at least an 8%. Like if I'm going to close on it and then resell it after close, wholetailing as they would call it, then I'm budgeting 8%, 5% closing, 3% uh, 3% closing on the purchase, 5% on the other side. And again, that's somewhat conservative because you've still got taxes and, and all that involved as well. So by having the wholesale happen prior to closing, you remove all of those fees. That's 8%. Um, charge right there. So, so there's definitely a place for this. Obviously you guys have a platform where you have the ability to close and to purchase on a substantial number of deals. Cause I, I maybe tell me a little bit about your partnership. I'm really excited to talk about how that dynamic has worked. Um, we've had your partner actually on our show and, and I'm also kind of curious to see like, how have you structured it? Because you don't want a phone call with a, a deal to call through and you're not in a position to, to deal with that. So I'm wondering early on how you raise that capital and how you kind of grew it, because I think that could be a challenge and maybe there's a solution for someone who doesn't have the ability to close, but still wants to wholesale. Maybe tell me a little bit about that. So one, like about closing, I think like if you don't have the capital to close, you probably shouldn't be wholesaling. Um, or at least you need to become a lot pickier about the properties that you get under contract. Uh, like if you're talking to someone and they need to close in 30 days because they've got a foreclosure or something coming up, 
for you to, to try to get a two week condition and then see if you can offload that property to another investor, ultimately fail at that and then be like, Hey, sorry, seller. I, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to close on this. Now you've got two weeks until you're being foreclosed on. Uh, I just think that's really unethical and you shouldn't do, you, do here's it. Here's a question that I, I don't know the answer to. How often does that happen? Is that, is that common so for us? I think, for other wholesalers, it might be very common. I don't know. I, I would think so because I mean, from a legal perspective, let's say the home's worth a million, I got 900. The the damage, the legal recourse is, well, you would relist the property to mitigate your damages and absolutely it will sell for a million. And I, I would think that that kind of safety net would be a reason for people to scam people that need the support, which again, kind of takes it outside of this. If you're dealing with someone who's unethical, that's a real issue that people are, they don't even realize because they, they haven't have been educated on that. So, yeah, I think like the way that we tend to do things is, is we will separate into kind of two camps, which is one sellers who are actually in distress. And in that situation, we're only going to lock up a contract if we're willing to buy it. So if we're willing to flip it, if we're willing to burr it and, and, you know, renovate it, refinance and like rent it out, fine, we'll get it under contract, but we won't get something under contract from someone who needs this, right? Sometimes you're dealing with people and it's just like, they, they kind of want to move, you know, they, they want to downsize, but they don't, they don't have a property under contract. You know, they're thinking maybe three, four, five months from now. Um, there, I feel like you can be a little bit more flexible right? Knowing that there's not really a consequence to this and it's not really any different than a traditional real estate transaction, which is like, you get stuff under contract, you have a conditional period. And if it doesn't meet your conditions, you're not going to buy it. Typically what that means is the price is too high, right? You're more or less. And I think you'll see this with, with newer wholesalers. They're trying, they're trying to get stuff under contract, but if it's basically just at market value, who's going to turn around and pay you a profit for that, but also give, you're giving up terms in a wholesale deal, right? And like those terms have value. And I'm sure as a real estate agent, you know, more than most, like uh, not buying something as is where is has a lot of value because you can find stuff in houses and you can go back to get some sort of recourse, if not through the seller, through title insurance or something like that. But when you buy as is where is like anything that comes up, that those are deadly. Those are deadly words <laughs> as is where is if anything pops up between now and the close, that's on you. If that's how it was and that's how it is. And, um, that's where it is, <laughs> but th those, those terms, um, you can have it almost the, the entire contract appear as if it's as is where it is, but it actually isn't until those words are used. Um, the seller would still be responsible for all of these things that come up. Maybe you have a neighbor complain and there's some kind of bylaws are on you. And there's something, maybe a lien hits the property. Those things all would fall on the seller. But as soon as the, as is where it is pops in all of a sudden, you're assuming all of those risks, risks today, risks next month, risks until the close. So anyways, just to kind of give some context. To, to yeah. That. So it's, and then that's part of what the discount is for as well Is just like, you're giving up typically significant terms to the seller, right? That's why they're selling at a discount. Um, and typically like, I think these days, you know, for anybody who's thinking about getting into wholesaling, it's not like I would tell somebody not to, but like, uh, if I were to start wholesaling today versus a year ago when I did, the road would be a lot harder and I would probably not, I wouldn't be where I am this quickly and I might actually never get there. Like you could easily spend $10,000 on marketing now and not get a deal. I got my first deal from a Google ad. I think I spent 30 or $40 on Google ads by that point. I got my first deal. I didn't wholesale it. I flipped it. Um, but I spent $25,000 on Google ads to get my next deal. Hmm. Uh, so you could easily start up, spend 25 grand, get zero deals and be walking away. Like, oh, you probably could have used like a first time home buyer credit at 5% and purchase something and, you know, bird it, appreciation, whatever, done another one a little bit later. So it's not that I'm discouraging people from doing it, but I think often when you listen to real estate podcasts, if you're listening to stuff that's even a year or two old, you're hearing people talk about numbers. Like you're not going to do that. I heard you on Andrew Hines, right? That's a great podcast as well. If you listen to the first, like he tells people, go back, listen to the first episodes, that everybody's just perfect burring everywhere. Everything you buy, <laughs> you all your money comes back and it's just like, and then people listen to that and they think that's what 
It's not what real estate investing is anymore. Certainly not like in Ontario anyways. That's why I, actually I didn't say anything, but that's why I was impressed when you said you had a near perfect burr on your duplex, the first one you had a, a partner with, because that, that was the first thing I thought of is that's, that's, that's a good success. That's a, that's a surprising level of success for someone that's just beginning. So. And it was a, it was a wholesale deal. Uh, and it was a terrible, like my contractor who, you know, has like 10, 15 projects on the go at a time told me like, this is the ugliest house I've ever seen. And I bought it sight unseen. And then we found these issues and we panicked and we're like, Oh my God, can we get out of this deal? Um, obviously the market was favorable to, to pretty much everyone, but a lot of it is just like the, you know, the worse the house is, the higher the opportunity is to push that value up, especially if you have the same appraiser who did the original appraiser come back and do the second one. And they see like, Oh my God, like it was, it was disgusting. You know, there's dog excrement everywhere. Like it was just, well, there's a tip right there. Is that a common thing you try to do? And you do you use lenders that have the flexibility with the appraiser to, to work with the both. So that's definitely, if you can, that's, that's a good way to go. Depending on which mortgage brokers you work with, some of them know, like they can, guess with pretty good uh, accuracy who the appraiser is going to be, but even just like directly through the bank, like if you're like, if you're in Toronto, a bank's probably got a dozen or 20, who knows how many appraisers that go and do houses for them. But as you go further from the city, it's probably going to be the same appraiser that RBC is sending to that house in, you know, Welland or whatever it is multiple times, right? Like that's something that you can kind of rely on. So hopefully you get the same appraiser. Um, but one thing I definitely recommend is, you know, don't be afraid of ugly houses. It takes the same amount of money to rip out a two out of 10 kitchen and replace it with a 10 out of 10 kitchen as to rip out a seven out of 10. Right. Yeah. But people get scared off. Yeah. That. yeah it's, it's the, the uh, pr a perspective you have now. Now I'm curious, you mentioned briefly about you're getting clients through the internet. What are maybe not just for you, what do you find for wholesalers right now are like the top three ways of getting clients that are effective? So everybody does mailers. I'm sure anybody listening to this podcast who lives in a house has gotten a ton of mailers. They still work, but uh, they're way less effective. Like you might need to send 20,000 pieces of mail to get a deal. If you know what you're doing, uh, I think you could easily send 50 or a hundred thousand pieces of mail. If you don't know what you're doing and never get a deal. Um, Cause I think one of the things, the mistakes people make is they think that like, this is about you and about you making money and it's not. And if that's the attitude you have, you're not, it's not going to work for you. Right. It needs to be, you need to be focused on creating solutions for sellers. They will feel your intention. Um, and, and that's how you ultimately make things happen is they have to trust you in two ways. One, they have to trust your competence. So you need to know about real estate. You need to know about transactions. You need to understand what are the costs associated with flipping a property for, for when you're doing your numbers and kind of working back from a, from a purchase, uh, like a flip after repair value. Right. So you've got to know that stuff, but then they also have to trust your intentions. Like, are you there for you or are you there for them? And it's, people are very good at spotting uh, people whose intentions are not in their self or are self-interested rather. Yeah. 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 So good tips. Any other, any other tips for someone that's maybe considering doing wholesaling or um, if we're running out of tips on there, I'm curious for people who are speaking to wholesalers, because I know you guys have a, a database of buyers too. What would be something that they should be keeping in mind as they're getting all of these emails for different wholesale opportunities? So one is like, always do your own due diligence. Um, don't just trust what the wholesaler is telling you about after repair value. Like hopefully you've got a realtor you've done some transactions with who can give you an idea of what they think the value is. Um, so number one, there's just do your own due diligence. Uh, I see wholesale deals that go by all the time that nobody buys that are great deals, right? So it's, and especially right now, I think investors are really timid right now. You know, we would typically get 10 to 15 calls per deal. Now we might get three to five. Um, we're still moving most of the stuff for, you know, fees that are not quite as good, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of 10 and 15 K fees right now, which are less than the person would have paid to a real estate agent, probably about half. I've of seen a, I have seen a lot of wholesale deals from various wholesale. I haven't seen many from you guys, but various wholesalers circling back and saying, Hey, we're doing another open house. So I, I I'm getting that sense as well that they're now, again, I guess that as a wholesaler, you got to position yourself to be willing to close or be in a position to um, like be 
just there has to be enough money available in the deal to be worthwhile for it to keep yourself on the tail end of that. But I, I could see, I do see what you're saying. Even in the last six to nine months, the adrenaline of buyers seems to be waning on the wholesale side of things. Maybe that's because of Burr. Maybe that's just a market. Like it, it's it's sweet to buy something and then know like I have to do nothing and get profit. And I think that that's an attitude a lot of wholesale buyers take, unfortunately. And then everything I can get from the Burr or from the renovation and the flip is gravy. But I, that's obviously not a long-term business model. And I think you're getting a lot of these guys that have that approach dropping off because they don't see that that free money isn't there anymore. Yeah, it's just it's just a tougher market. I think that on the one hand, it's like sellers are typically behind on what's happening, right? And so at times that's going to be good for you when you're buying houses. If like people aren't aware, it might have gone up another 10000 And you're like, oh, okay, you can make a $10,000 spread by buying this house. But everyone is aware of the hot market. Uh, the difference is it's, it's definitely cooling, right? Like you're a real estate agent. There's not the same number of offers. Uh, and it doesn't mean that prices are down or down significantly, but there's definitely a cooling of the behavior of, of buyers. So if you're a wholesaler right now, you've got sellers who want more than they've ever wanted before, mostly not realistic, like, you know, comparing their house to someone whose house is much nicer, but nearby. And then you've got buyers who are worried about the future of what's going to happen with real estate prices. And so they want a bigger discount and it's, it's tough to, to bring those two people together right now. So you need to be uh, bringing more deals out. You have to be putting out more stuff. That's just like, look, 20,000 or $30,000 less than MLS is still $30,000 less than MLS. Uh, and if you are someone who's trying to flip a house or burn a property, um, that's still, that's still $30,000 you can put into your renos or, or, or keep or whatever. Right. So it's not, it's not meaningless money, but I think the days uh, of huge discounts off retail are, are just, they're kind of over at least for the time being. Yeah. So I shake my head a little bit at realtors that don't take the time to investigate wholesaling. Cause I think it's a good opportunity for you as a buyer agent, but I think in the, in the defense and protection of the industry, they try, they, they see it as a threat and they just kind of, it's not worth their investigating. But um, I, I want to talk a little bit about you and your partnership and the dynamic that you have. But one of the other things that actually came to mind as you were speaking, it just came back to me, is do you guys ever private lend? Do you ever find yourself in a position to support this quick, dire, distressed person in, in addition to wholesale? Or is that part of your business model? Or do you partner with someone to do that? Or do you just say, no, we're just going to buy it. That's the easiest way. That's what we're good at. Yeah, it's just kind of like, I think I know like Aaron has talked about doing that that previous wholesaler you had on about in sometimes like extending loans. Like we have extended loans to people whose houses we have under contract because, you know, one guy, he's like, I need storage, a couple storage containers to move my stuff. Closing's not for four months. And so we ended up lending him, I think five or $10,000 to, to help him cover expenses. Uh, and it was like, it was a zero interest loan. It was just like, you need this. And like, we're trying to help you out. Um, so it's not really part, part of it is because like we flip and we, and we burr properties as well. So like typically, you know, when deals aren't moving, we're just like, okay, we'll buy it. Um, and which is great because if you work with us as a potential seller, it's like there, that's an extra layer of like, it's not just if, if we can't move it, it's done. It's like, we'll, we'll do what we can to make the numbers work. Yeah. Uh, and most of the units, I think we acquired 16 so far this year. Those are basically, it was all deals that didn't move. Nobody else wanted them, even though they're good deals. And so we're just like, okay, we'll just borrow money from private lenders uh, and, and do it ourselves. So for us, it is a capital intensive business. Marketing spend is a lot. You know, we just hired, um, we're up to four wholesalers working with us. And so like, that's a lot of incremental uh, spend that we're doing every month, but we've got, you know, an eight plex and a six plex that we're renovating currently. Um, that we took down, that's not cheap either. So I think um, long term, I think private lending is the way to go. Like it's, I think the least headaches versus the the returns, right? Like if you could have a twenty, thirty million dollar portfolio and kind of liquidate that and just get, you know, two or three million or more dollars per year in in passive income, that to me sounds pretty awesome. Uh, we're just not there yet, so we're more soliciting private funds. So we 
originally we're working primarily with brokers, but now we've moved to um, just letting people know what we're up to and that there's opportunities to work with us for great returns. Uh, and so we started borrowing direct from individuals who are lending us out of their RRSPs or, or otherwise. Um, and then we're also looking next year, we want to scale pretty aggressively from an acquisition standpoint. So keeping a higher percentage of the deals, wholesaling less, keeping more and bringing JV partners What's, on. What are your plans uh, for next year for 22? So we talked about it and we think that picking up a hundred units is um, realistic. Uh, it's not, it's not going to be easy and we're going to have to have capabilities and capacities that we don't have today. But, you know, just looking back two years, like two years ago, I didn't know anything. Uh, now I know a little. Um, I think those curves kind of tend to be a bit exponential and plus the network, the network effect of like, as you get better, the people that are willing to spend time and talk with you and teach you what they're doing. Um, so all that stuff kind of compounds. So we'd like to take on a hundred units. We'll do a lot of it with private money. Um, but we are definitely open and we'll start looking more to JV partnerships. Uh, we don't want to manage a ton of relationships. So the idea is like get a handful of people who have enough money to do three, four five deals, uh, and understand that the big picture return for them is massive as well. Uh, but they're hands off because we just don't want to deal with, uh, deal with a lot of different relationships, especially with people who like, if the money's that important to them, right. There's too many questions and stuff. It's like, if you want to move fast, you don't have time to explain what you're doing to people all the time. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're going to give us a little story. I think this is a good way to kind of, um, get a little bit of insight in how this works. So you buy a property, you close on it. Give me an example of maybe a flip that you've done recently. Um, and what kind of returns, like what success do you get? Cause obviously you're leaning more towards closing on them as you're talking about your 22 goals. So that's kind of the direction. Wholesaling is your starting point. Maybe give me an example of one you've been able to, uh, to, to conquer. So I bought basically, I think it was in around December. So I had just started like sending out mail a couple months earlier and then I decided, okay, I'm going to try this Google ad. And, uh, I drove out to Havelock. So about 30 minutes east of Peterborough. Uh, the house was terrible. It was vacant. They hadn't been there for two years. It was filled with junk. Um, there were some signs of water damage, but there was like a huge pool. Uh, and I just thought this, this would be an interesting flip, like with a nice pool. I think that's pretty cool. Um, it wasn't even like a COVID motivated thing at the time yet. That wasn't really a thing, recognizing how people were going to love pools. Um, but I closed on it in January. Originally, I was just going to do like a, you know, I was like, oh, just do $50,000 renovation. Um, but I think from a design aesthetic, I just have finer taste than that. And so once I updated some stuff, the stuff that wasn't being updated looked bad. So I went from a $50,000 budget to $150,000 budget. Shoot. Um, so I purchased for 210, right. Which is cheap. It was like a thousand square foot bungalow, um, that was in rough condition and vacant. Uh, I put about 150,000 in between that includes closing costs, everything else. Again, I did this with none of my own money. Um, I went to a mortgage broker. I got a hundred percent loan to value on the property because it appraised or is actually just like a, a realtor's recommendation of value or whatever it's called. Basically said my realtor was like, Hey, we think this is worth probably 250, 260 as is. And we think afterwards, you know, it could be worth 400 plus. And it was a real estate that was the private lender. So he was comfortable with that. Um, so I used none of my own money. I used home Depot credit card. Uh, or whatever line of credit, whatever it is, because you get the six months, no payment on everything that you buy. Yeah, and that's then, a tip. People look into that if you haven't. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And you can do it at Lowe's too. I haven't double dipped on both, but like they will give you significant amounts of credit because you're spending it all at their store. Right. Yeah. So um, I did all the renovations on lines of credit and the Home Depot card all in for three for around 360. Uh, we listed. So it took longer. It was like I wanted to be in and out in three months. It took seven. Um, but I think that was partly my fault. Stuff I learned is scope creep. I know now that like, I'm going to want to do everything. So scope everything from the beginning. Obviously there was COVID timelines impacted like supply chain stuff, but uh, we ended up listing for 449 in the hopes of, you know, getting an offer somewhere in the low to mid fives. Um, we had, so we did it for eight days. We got over 50 showings and um, we got seven offers including one for, uh, I guess a little over 130 K over asking. Um, and so we, we, we went firm at 579 and I'm probably 
profit somewhere in the 180 to 190, um, which is crazy. And That's like, crazy good. Yep. it's not, it's not scalable. Like I'm fully aware, like I was a beneficiary of market condition as a beneficiary of the fact that it had a giant pool and like, it's a two year delay to get pools. Now all sorts of things broke my way. A bunch of things didn't break my way. Water damage had to replace the roof, had to replace all the exterior walls. Uh, so there's a lot of additional work I had to do, but I ended up basically rebuilding this house and rebuilding the garage um, and it all worked out. So um, I know that's not realistic. You know, if I hit 50, 60 K on a flip, I'm pretty happy. Um, but it was a pretty amazing one to, and it's closing October 1st. So pretty excited to redeploy that capital. So guys, if, if you want to get involved in what Wayland's doing, feel free to reach out. What's the name of the company? Um, so Austin Ye is your partner. Uh, he runs actually, I'm sure a lot of our listeners follow the Rise podcast as well. Um, what, what's the company name? So, so if you want to buy wholesale deals from us, we are Ontario Property Deals. Uh, and so you can go to the website, ontariopropertydeals.ca to get on our buyers list. We sell a lot of stuff, particularly in Northern Ontario. We do stuff down here as well, but uh, for investors that want cash flow and that want to be able to scale portfolio, we think that North Bay, Sudbury, those types of areas are pretty great spots to be. And it's where we're doing most of our buying yep. uh, for that reason. And, and, and I know you're very active on social. I see what you're doing there as well. How can people reach out to you directly? Yeah. So Waylon McGill uh, on either Facebook or Instagram, that's where I tend to post the most. Uh, so follow me on there. You can also uh, link up with me on LinkedIn. I am in you know the white collar corporate world. So that's a pretty good place to get in touch with me as well. Um, and I'll just say like, you know, if you want to, you know, there's that phrase, like if you want to move fast, go alone, or you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with other people. Um, partnering up with Austin fairly early on in wholesaling, like once I figured out the model and proved that I was really good at it, uh, you know, I knew he had a bunch of skills that I didn't necessarily have. He'd already bird like, you know, 15, 20 properties. So his actual real estate knowledge was better than mine but he's much, he's a more systematic uh, and detail oriented person than I am. And so through partnering, it was possible to, to massively exceed what, you know, I could have done individually or what Austin could have done in wholesaling individually. And then similarly, just like hiring people, like if you want to accomplish stuff, it's really tough to do this on your own. Like if, even if I quit my job and went full time at it, I don't think I'd be where I am without recognizing the value in partnerships and hiring. Jam-packed with info today. It's been a good chat. Guys, if you could, if you have comments or questions for Waylon, leave them in the chat. We'll keep an eye on them and make sure those are responded to. And um, share it on social media. You can tag us as well. We're at Watson Estates on Instagram. But uh, Waylon, appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come share. And we look forward to watching you through 2022 and seeing just how far you guys can go. It's a date. Love it. Thank you. Take care.